from the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. Today is Tuesday, March 11, 2013. My name is John Dittmer and I'm here in Jackson, Mississippi with videographer John Bishop to interview Ms. Uvestra Simpson, a leading activist in the civil rights movement in Mississippi. This interview will become part of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. Ms. Simpson, we are delighted to be here today and we thank you for taking the time to talk with us. Uh, let's begin by talking about your early life. Where were you born and raised? I was born in the Mississippi Delta in uh, Irbina, and I lived there until I was uh, about 14 years old. I'm the youngest of seven children, and um, during part of my parents' um, earlier marriage, um, they did well. My father was a, was a butcher by trade. Mm -hmm. And, but as times changed, um, part of their lives um, were spent as sharecroppers. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, when they had um, times that were good, they would leave uh, the plantation and move to Greenwood. And once they moved to Greenwood, and several of my siblings were born when they actually lived in Greenwood. Now, my, my mother is from, originally from the Mount Bayou area. She was born and lived and grew up until she was 18 on her grandfather's uh, farm. My, grand, my great grandfather um, actually attended college, and I think he must have been in that first generation after emancipation mm -hmm. proclamation. So he actually went to college, he was a teacher, and he was a minister, he pastored a church, and he owned a farm. And my mother was born, and she grew up there until she met my father. And um, it's really funny. I have to tell this story if we have, if we have a minute to let me digress. My mother once told me how she met my father. It was during revival at my great-grandfather's um, church. And my great-grandfather owned a car. He actually bought a brand-new car. I think it was a Model T. And it was the kind that you had to go at, when, when you started it, you had to go crank it up. Mm -hmm. So uh, she had met my father during the course of the, um, of the revival. And within a few days, he had convinced her to elope with him. And she said, well, she was really not sure about it. So she asked God to give her a sign if she wasn't supposed to do that. So they went out and she had put on... Um, two of everything, two dresses, just, just doubled up because she knew she was eloping. And she went, they went out and got in the car, and my great-grandfather, she called him Buddy, and she said, Buddy went out to start the car, and he was cranking and cranking, and it wouldn't start. And she said, a brand new car, and, we, and she said, that was my sign, and I knew it. But I ignored him anyway. I ignored that <laughs> sign. And so the next night, the car started, and we eloped. And when my parents got married, they moved to a farm that was owned by a friend of my great-grandfather's. And that's where they set up their, their life at first. And um, while they were living on that, so this, this particular man owned a lot of acreage, and he had many tenants on his land. And so my parents rented um, land from him, and they farmed. And life was good mm -hmm. until, you know, later on when things changed. Mm -hmm. And this man lost his land, and my great-grandfather lost his land somehow. And then they um, had to do sharecropping and other things in order to make a living for a while. And when I was uh, maybe 10 or 11, they finally left um, the plantation and we moved, we actually moved to Itabina. Uh -huh. And but and during those uh, years, let's, my oldest sister, um, I mean my only sister, got married when I was nine years old. Mm -hmm. And she moved to Chicago and I would spend summers mm -hmm. with her. And eventually, um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about how the school year, the school system was set up when I was growing yeah, up. Yeah, please do. Um, and I'm not sure what year. I attended elementary school at Ellis Rogers. That was on the campus of uh, Valley State University. And by the time, and then 
um, I, during the seventh grade, seventh through the ninth grade, I attended school that was uh, in Itabina, right across the street from where we lived. And when I got to the 10th grade, um, the school system had, um, the school board had consolidated the entire school system. And they built a brand new school where all the black kids had to be bussed in from across the county. And the name of that school was Amanda Elsey. And the problem with that is that, you know, some of the kids, I mean, we, it took us about maybe 45 minutes to get to school to an hour. But some of the kids lived in, you know, the far end of the counties, and it took a long time for them to get there. And so at that point, um, we had what they call a split session, where we would go to school in the middle of the summer so the kids could be out um, to pick cotton, or no, not chop, but pick cotton during the, the fall. And so I was the last child that my parents were raising, and they were just kind of fed up with, you know, with the way the educational system was working. And so she talked to my older sister, and they decided that I would move to Racine when I was mm -hmm. 14. So I moved to Racine okay. to, um, yeah. um, to go to high school. Yeah. I, I would, yeah, that is, we, I want to spend some time on that with a contrast. I was very interested okay. in what you were saying. But you grew up in the Mississippi Delta, which somebody mm -hmm. called the most southern place mm -hmm. on earth. Tell us a little bit about what it was like to okay. be in the Delta. Let me um, have a sip of water. My parents were like most of the people, most of the other people in my community. They were you know, economically depressed. It was totally segregated. All the schools were segregated. The neighborhoods were segregated. Um, most of the people made their living by either sharecropping or hiring themselves out as day workers to go and chop and pick mm -hmm. cotton. You know, of course, there were the teachers and the preachers and some shop owners because everything was totally segregated. Mm -hmm. You know, we, it was like a self-sufficient community. Mm -hmm. We had, um, you know, dry cleaners, and of course there were lots of churches and beauty parlors, and maybe a convenience store, or two. Because my parent, my father, later in life, um, this is after let me say, I must have been seventeen or eighteen. So he opened a convenience mm -hmm. store, and that's and he he ran that little store. It was actually built right next to the house that we to that that they owned, and but in the earlier years. Um, it was a very close-knit community where everybody looked out for everybody else. And one of the things, but of course nobody was, um, was um, I mean, everybody knew their place. I mean, mm -hmm. they knew. But uh, most of these people had at some point been independent and either mm -hmm. their, them or their, their parents had mm -hmm. owned land until mm -hmm probably somewhere around the, the 20s or the 30s. Most mm -hmm. people lost their land and that's when they became sharecroppers and totally dependent on, um, on, you know, on the white people who had the economic power mm -hmm. and, and, and everything else. And so their lives, they felt like they had no power except to do as they were, mm -hmm. as they were told to do in this really confined, um, economically depressed area. So, um, what was, uh, how did you spend your days when you were a kid? Did you, did you work in the fields? Did you? Oh, I did a little bit, but I mean, I was really young mm -hmm. when we were, um, I tried, uh, <laughs> to chop cotton, wasn't very good at it, mm -hmm. cut it all down and I wasn't allowed to do it anymore, mm -hmm. which was fine with me because I'm not an outdoor mm -hmm. Dorsey person, I can't stand bugs, and I mean, mm -hmm. being a country girl from the Delta, you would think I'd have no problems, but I'm scared to death of, yeah. of all kinds of bugs and spiders and things, and I was never, I tried to pick cotton, I think maybe once or twice I may have picked about 50 pounds, and mm -hmm. you know, that was not uh, going to cut it, yeah. when there were people picking maybe three and 400 pounds mm -hmm. of cotton a mm -hmm. day, but you have to remember, I was only, you know, I was a kid. Yeah. What did so, you do to have fun? Oh, I played with my friends, mud cakes, cooking and mm -hmm. pretending mm -hmm. to be, uh, you know, cooking. And uh, we didn't have very many toys. We only received toys at Christmas. You know, mm -hmm. I, got a, I got one toy at Christmas and then lots and lots of uh, 
food mm -hmm. and fruits and nuts and things. Now, one thing, okay, I mentioned earlier that my father was a butcher by trade. Mm -hmm. So what that meant was that in the fall, now my brother just reminded me of this recently because I don't have a great memory of this. But in the fall, um, all the neighbors would, um, would get my father to come around to their house and, and kill a hog or something. And so if he was not paid, I don't think he was paid in money. He was probably paid in cuts of meat. Because mm -hmm. I remember once when we were living on a plantation, we actually had a smokehouse. Mm. And it was, and once, I mean, we were not allowed in it, but mm. there were, you know, I went in it and it just about scared me to death. I saw all these great big hams hanging up oh, and, yeah. and my mother made uh, homemade sausages. And so it was just packed full of that kind of stuff. So, and when I was growing up, they also had um, huge gardens and, and with all kinds of fresh mm. vegetables. And in the fall, my mother would can or make, you know, dry um, uh, peas and beans, but there was all kinds of uh, uh, fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. Did your siblings then pitch in with all the work on the? Oh yes, mm -hmm. yes, everybody did, and mm -hmm. I guess because I was the youngest, I mean, mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't have to do very yeah. much. No. And my sister absolutely hated it. So, mm -hmm. and all of them did not like farm. None of them liked farm work. Mm -hmm. And I have a brother who lives in Detroit now, and he is—he's um, 81 years old. Mm -hmm. So there was, you know, you know, there was, my mother had like five kids and then there was a, a gap and then mm -hmm. she had two more mm -hmm. at the end. And so I'm that last one that she had. But I was, had a conversation with my brother. He came down here last year and the year before. He's still driving. He gets oh. in his car and he drives down here at 80. I mean, he gets around like he's 60. So he was telling me that when he was like, okay, I have seven, um, there's seven of us in all. I grew up with four, with, mm -hmm. with three other siblings and myself. So by the time I was three years old, my three older siblings were gone. They just couldn't take it anymore. They left. And my brother, Sylvester, who lives in Detroit, was telling me that when they first left home, that they actually went to live with my grandparents for a while. And they, my grandparents lived right outside of, um, of Itabina in a little community called Berkeley. And that's, and he told me that him and my older brothers, my other two brothers, actually worked for the city of Greenwood, mm -hmm. they, and they worked for the power company, and I had no knowledge of yeah. this. And so they worked uh, for the city of Greenwood, I think, picking up garbage and actually driving um, the garbage truck. Mm -hmm. So, and my family, too, is a part of... Um, you know, the Great Migration. Mm -hmm. They went, as soon as they were old enough, they all left and they went north and they worked in the auto industry mm -hmm. and, you know, they would um, send boxes of clothes yeah. back and things back, you know, when, because they all had good jobs yeah. and they bought property and what, they were, what, were you, what were your aspirations? What did you want to do when you grew up? When you were well, when I, I thought that I would become an actor. Uh -huh. That's what mm -hmm. I had a passion for. Did you go to the movies I, a lot? Um, no, not really. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, well, sometimes I went to the movies, but when I was in like the third grade, I used to, you know, I had the leading roles in the plays mm -hmm. when I was in the seventh grade. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, I got picked to have the leading role in the senior production. Mm -hmm. And now what happened though, I probably would have had more experience as an actor, um, as acting, but when I left at 14 and I went to Racine, it was a cultural shock. Yeah. I went to a school that uh, out of 2,000 kids, there were maybe like 10% of them were, were black, okay? Mm -hmm. And in the, so I joined the, the drama, the dramatics club, and I never get picked, got yeah. picked for a part, you know? They just, they were doing Antigone and mm. things like that. Yeah. And, so I remember that the only part that I ever got was um, when we did Winnie the Pooh. I, got, I played the rabbit in Winnie the Pooh. Uh, of course, you wear all this makeup yeah, and nobody yeah. can tell what you are or anything. Mm -hmm. So that was a big disappointment. Mm -hmm. And so it was just a cultural shock for me yeah. to be. All the teachers were white, even the janitors, yeah. the cooks in the, in the cafeteria. Well, by the, by the time you got there, you had seen things that none of your classmates up north had seen. And I was 
just doing some statistical mm -hmm. checking and the lynching of Emmett Till occurred when you were what, about 10 years old? I was old? 10, I think I was been, let's see, that was 54, 55. Yeah, yeah. I was nine years old. And let me, oh, I yeah. can tell you about that. Yeah, yeah. I remember we used to get the Jet magazine. Mm -hmm. And we, of course, we had heard about Emmett Till. I was the first one to get the magazine, and I started flipping through it, and I got to this page where this picture of him was, you know, and, oh, I just remember screaming and throwing it across the room, and I never wanted to see it again. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just absolutely horrible, just horrible. This was and, the, the, the bloated corpse that uh, yes. Mamie Till, Emma's mother, insisted mm -hmm. that the coffin be open, and thousands exactly. of people filed by in Chicago, and it became one of the most famous photographs. Um, what what was uh, what were your folks you know what what kind of things do you remember what they were saying at the time did they give you you know it seems like every kid seemed like that they would think that could I be next oh we were all scared because mm -hmm. we didn't know what was going mm -hmm. to happen you know if they could kill you know a teenager for uh, you know for something that I mean as minor as maybe mm -hmm. looking at a yeah. white woman mm -hmm. or, or trying to talk to her we just didn't know what would mm -hmm. happen. And um, it was not long after that. It was either the, the year after, I think, that Reverend George Lee Yeah, talk about that. Killed. He was a friend he of your father. He was a father's. friend of my father's, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, my father was a member of the NAACP, but he was, mm -hmm. it was just, you know, it was kept very quiet. Yeah. And my father went to the funeral, and um, a couple weeks or so after that, we... They, um, a newsletter was sent out, maybe a month mm -hmm. after that, uh, a newsletter of his, you know, with pictures of the funeral and all the proceedings and all, was, was mailed out. And we were still living um, on, a, on a plantation mm -hmm. at that point, because I was, yeah, nine years mm -hmm. old, nine or ten. And we were looking through that newsletter trying to find, uh, see if my father was in some of the pictures. Mm -hmm. And we could not find a picture of him, and so we just put it aside. And then later, one of us picked it up, and there he was mm -hmm. on the front cover oh, wow. of that. Wow. And just looking down at the casket, and mm -hmm. somehow we lost that, that newsletter. Mm -hmm. For the mm -hmm. sake of the audience, the Reverend George <clears throat> Lee was very active in voting rights at, at that time and was gunned down and of course nobody was ever tried or convicted of his right. crime. Um, the Brown decision saying that segregated schools were illegal uh, came out the year before in 54. Do you have any recollection of that and what it had no immediate impact in your area, did it? No, it had no immediate impact. I mean, things went on as they had always mm -hmm. been. We were still in segregated schools. I think maybe it did have some impact, but we just, but not indirectly it was. Mm -hmm. that there was some impact because that's right after that is when they built, uh, maybe right, yeah, right at that, the school, the brand new elementary school that I attended starting in the third grade. Before then, when the first school I went to was in a church. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, where they had two teachers, one for the little kids and one for the older mm -hmm. students. You know. Yeah, that was the time that Mississippi mm -hmm. legislature appropriated money to make separate but equal mm -hmm. <laughs> a yes. fact, thinking they could avoid desegregation. So a lot of schools got built. Not too many laboratories, no, no libraries with books, exactly. but new buildings were built. Um, I want to, want to go to Wisconsin <laughs> shortly, but uh, tell me about uh, your spiritual life. Was the church an important part of your uh, family's life? The church was very important. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, they were, like I said earlier, my parents were like everybody else. They were hardworking, church-going people. You mm -hmm. went to church every Sunday, and then Sunday afternoon you were back there for the BTU and whatever mm -hmm. else, and then, you know, Bible um, on, on Wednesday, Bible study. Um, on Wednesday, I mean, the church was really important, but when early on, when my parents lived in the country, they um, didn't have church in their, you know, the church that they were members mm -hmm. of every Sunday because the minister lived somewhere else. And um, so he would come every other Sunday mm -hmm. to church, but the church was very important mm -hmm. in our lives. It was the center yeah. of, of everything, you know, every, all the social activity, just everything. Mm -hmm. 
And, the, and that was the only place where people could feel like that mm -hmm. they could express themselves and have and demonstrate their leadership abilities mm -hmm. or whatever. My father was um, was a Sunday school teacher. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, once we were living in Edbina, <clears throat> he became like one of the major Sunday school teachers. And my mother would spend uh, Saturdays, because he loved to, to have his things all demonstrated. She would, using butcher block paper, writing out mm -hmm. and drawing his Sunday school lesson oh. so he could demonstrate mm -hmm. it on, on Sundays. So oh. yes, the church mm -hmm. was, was extremely important. You said that they s decided to send you to Wisconsin with your sister because they were just sort of getting fed up with the school system and the mm -hmm. divided. Uh, this must have been a tough decision though to send your little girl, your last, uh, away. Well. It wasn't all that tough mm -hmm. because, like I said, I had spent, um, you know, I'd gone away this couple summers mm -hmm. to live with my sister. And they were coming back every summer to visit, you mm -hmm. know. So I was a fairly easy decision yeah. for them. Mm -hmm. You know, I was the youngest one and they, you know, they were getting older and, mm -hmm. and they wanted, to, wanted me to have a, you know, a good uh, yeah. solid education. But it was always a... A temporary thing. I had yeah. always intended to come back yeah. and, and go to college. Mm -hmm. um, Tell us, so. uh, you were mentioning that Racine was much different. Uh, expand it was very on that different. Thing. Very different. I was, it was, I was in for a cultural shock when I, especially the school, you know, mm -hmm. like I said. Could we pause for yeah. the mm -hmm. siren go very fast, so continue. Okay. All right. So uh, Racine then was different than the Mississippi Delta. Talk about your experiences there, school, town, uh, how, how it was to make that adjustment? Well, the, the major difference is that for the first time in my life, I actually, um, you know, interacted with, with white people. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to school with them because uh, back in Mississippi, all the schools were totally segregated. But I actually, uh, this was the first time, and I actually had a few friends who were white um, at, at Washington Park High School. Mm -hmm. And the thing that was different about the school is that it was, I was just shocked at the, at all the, you know, the beautiful library, mm -hmm. the equipment that they mm -hmm. had, and, and, you know, I was very athletic, so mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I could, I played um, uh, field hockey and, and soccer, and, and I took tennis mm -hmm. lessons and all that stuff, and I was just, I did tumbling and all mm -hmm. of that stuff, and I'd, I'd never... I'd never been exposed to mm -hmm. things like that. I just didn't even know that that kind of stuff existed, mm -hmm. especially for um, a high school. But the main shock was that um, if, you know, you were lucky if you had one other black kid in, your, mm -hmm. in a class mm -hmm. with you. And, um, but I got along very well, I mean, after a while, but I was really embarrassed to tell people that I was from Mississippi. I got teased mm -hmm. about that, you uh -huh. know. About, accent problems? About, <laughs> well, I really didn't have yeah. an accent problem. Mm -hmm. It just was just being from, from Mississippi, mm -hmm. you know, and people call it, oh, Bigfoot country and all that. So I just didn't tell very many people yeah. that I was from Mississippi because I was just, I didn't mm -hmm. want to be teased mm -hmm. about it, you know. But um, my, my sister was on her, had gotten onto her second marriage. And so her the husband at that point, when I went to live with her, um, had a daughter who's about my age, and she was my protector. Mm -hmm. We went to school together, and she knew everybody, mm -hmm. you know, because she had lived there all of her life, well, most mm -hmm. of her life. And so she was very helpful, me, helpful to me. Her name is Ruth, Ruth Days. Mm -hmm. And we became best, best friends. Mm -hmm. So Did you run into any segregation problems there, or, or, or was it a unique experience to go into a restaurant and sit down at the counter and have a coke you know and um i don't i don't think things were were that were, were segregated mm -hmm. in in racine you know that so mm -hmm. we didn't have that kind of a mm -hmm. problem the problem that that i remember is that during the summers we didn't have much to do because the few jobs you know racine is not a really really big town yeah. it mm -hmm. may be oh it's probably under a hundred thousand and the few jobs that teenagers could get all went to white kids. Yeah. 
So I remember yeah. there was an A&W root beer not far from where we lived, and I wanted to work there, but of course they I never got hired. Mm -hmm. I asked about it. So the only work that I could get was babysitting for you know some of my sister's uh, friends. Mm -hmm. And so that was, um, you know, in that regard, there was not that much difference. Yeah. Um, you came and, back uh, during your senior year. That, I that, did. That, uh, I, I would have thought you would have graduated up there and then come well, back. Well, you know, w I wanted to go to college, and my parents thought there may, and I'm not even sure about this, but we thought that there may be a problem with uh, with without my graduating from a school out of the state and mm -hmm. wanting to go to a public school because mm -hmm. I was originally going to go to Valley State mm -hmm. until after I got involved in the movement mm -hmm. and you know found out about Tougaloo and all. So they thought that there may be an issue with uh, my graduating from an you know and having an mm -hmm. address uh, in mm -hmm. Wisconsin and mm -hmm. then trying to get into school here. Mm -hmm. So I came back and finished up my last semester mm -hmm. at Amanda Elsey in Greenwood. And that's the mm -hmm. school that I originally had started yeah. the high school uh -huh. in, um, across the summer. Mm -hmm. yeah. while, while you were gone, we had a lot going on in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. You had the uh, Freedom Rides, you had the Tougaloo mm -hmm. sit-in, and you had the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, mm -hmm coming into Macomb and then moving up to the Mississippi Delta. So by the time you got back, a whole lot was going on in, on, in and around Greenwood with voter registration campaigns, white mm -hmm. violence, police dogs being set loose on demonstrators, the federal government sort of coming in but not really doing much. Mm -hmm. Tell us what it was like coming back into that and what motivated you to jump in with both feet. Well, when I was in Racine, I'd gotten involved with, I joined the youth group, youth chapter of the NAACP there, and mm -hmm. we heard about what was going on down here, you know, with Meredith and, and um, the Freedom Rides and all, and we actually thought that we could get a bus and, and come down here. Mm -hmm. It was a bunch, about 20 uh, students who were in, uh, 20 of us who had been in, who were involved in the NAACP, but that just didn't happen. So when I came back here in the winter in, in January of 1963, I mean, things were going full blast because mm -hmm. we hadn't been back here in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I was just, I didn't know what to expect. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, the movement was in full force in Greenwood and in Itabina. And mm -hmm. then a friend of mine invited me to attend a mass meeting in Greenwood, and this must have been maybe around um, a couple of months before I got out of high school. Mm -hmm. And when I got to that mass meeting, I tell you that it was just amazing with all the freedom songs and mm -hmm. all these young people mm -hmm. who were leading things. I mean, I think Hollis Watkin was there, Giat was there, John O'Neill, mm -hmm. Mary Lane, mm -hmm. and then I met my lifelong friend, uh, June Johnson. Mm -hmm. And I became very close to June and her family. Mm -hmm. But that night at that meeting, I decided, I knew that I had, you know, just found exactly yeah. what I was looking for. And that was the opportunity to work with, you know, with people to change um, the conditions mm -hmm. that we lived in. You know, all my life I knew that I was not going to be living the kind of life that my parents mm -hmm. lived. And... What did your parents think about your getting involved? In they that were life? they were a little bit reluctant, mm -hmm. you know, <clears throat> for you. to get me to let me get involved in it. I'm gonna tell you a story about uh, mm -hmm. what my father. Uh, he had a conversation with Lawrence Giat. Okay, mm -hmm. when, when I told after I graduated high school, I told them I wanted to get involved full time in in the movement until the fall when I could um, start college. So my father was really reluctant. He said, "I tell you what." I'm going to go ahead and let you get involved, but you got to give me the name of somebody who's in charge over there. And I said, well, that's going to be kind of hard because mm -hmm. I don't know who's in charge. <laughs> it's just, it's, uh, it looks like there's no one particular person. And I think my, my father said, well, I heard about this fellow named Giat. Mm -hmm. And so he said, I'm going to call him. You give me, get me his number. My father found the number somehow, and I didn't because I, I didn't want him calling mm -hmm. telling somebody to be in charge of me and all mm -hmm. that. But anyway, a week or two later, I was in the SNCC office in Greenwood, and Giard came up to me and he said, I got a call from your daddy. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, <laughs> don't tell me. He said, and he put me in charge of you. 
<laughs> he told me that <laughs> if anything happened to you, that I'm going to be, he's going to hold me responsible. And he, I never let me forget that. <laughs> never. <laughs> and you met Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer about that time. Tell I us met about Mrs. Your Hamer. Relationship, your early relationship, impressions, your friendship. Okay. Um, I really got to know Miss Hamer. I'd seen her around the office. I'd seen, heard her sing in mm -hmm. mass meetings, but mm -hmm. I really had not actually, you know, gotten really close to her until um, Anel Ponda, who was at that point with SCLC, mm -hmm. and uh, she wanted a group of people to attend uh, citizenship school in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, one of the ones who were selected, uh, Miss Hamer and June Johnson mm -hmm. and several other mm -hmm. people were selected to go <clears throat> to the citizenship school. It was a two week um, school. And when we got to the bus station, so we were gonna ride the bus over there, Anel said to us, um, can we stop a minute? Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, sure. let me see. Sorry. Okay, so when we were, <clears throat> getting ready to um, to leave, and we left out of Greenwood to go to Charleston, South Carolina. Anel said to us, you know, I will be using the white side of, of the waiting room whenever we stop, and because it's illegal for them to still have two separate waiting rooms mm -hmm. in, in bus stations. Um, and she said, you don't have to do this because we're I'm likely to get arrested for doing mm -hmm. this, especially when we're in Mississippi. And I'm not saying that you have to do it. I'm just telling you that if you want to, mm -hmm. it's, it's your choice, but I will be doing it. And so on the way over there, we, whenever the bus stopped, we used the, um, the waiting room on the white side without any problems. And we were over there for two weeks, and what we, uh, Miles Horton was one of the, um, the people, you know, Miles the Horton from the Highlander, mm -hmm. and uh, Miss um, Septima Clark mm -hmm. was one of our teachers, and there was a man, um, was it, is it Esau Jenkins maybe, mm -hmm. was one of the, the instructors, and that's, I also met Guy and Candy um, Carowan, Carowan mm -hmm. during that time. And we learned, just learned all the basics about what it meant to be a citizen, what your rights were, how important it was to vote, mm -hmm. and, um, and, what, and that was just demonstrating your rights as, um, you know, as a citizen of this, of this country. The right to vote, the right to elect people to mm -hmm. represent you, and what we were supposed to do from that information that we got from the citizenship school was to go back and, and help and have and conduct workshops mm -hmm. to train other people mm -hmm. on the importance of, of what it meant. And mm -hmm. it was your responsibility. It, it was our responsibility mm -hmm. to be good citizens yeah. by, you know, getting people to register to vote mm -hmm. and when, you know, and to register ourselves and to actually, um, you know, to carry out and to do the things that, you know, once you mm -hmm. became a registered voter. Mm -hmm and to carry out your civic responsibility as a citizen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And with the SNCC project and voter registration, well, you could just move yeah. right back into that exactly. with what you'd learned. So by the time, see, at first, you know, SNCC was, was focused, um, I learned this later, on uh, direct action. Mm -hmm. But by the time I got involved in the movement, the, the focus was on uh, voter mm -hmm. registration. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I got involved mm -hmm. in, voter registration. I did a lot of canvassing. Uh, you know, the door-to-door -door mm -hmm. in Greenwood. June and I were always um, together mm -hmm. walking the streets. She knew the area, and we walked the streets of Greenwood, you know, and we also went to, in my hometown, went to Itabina, and, you know, people really didn't want to listen, especially the folks in my hometown, mm -hmm. didn't want to listen to me about anything. Um, they said, you know, We've been doing just fine, you mm -hmm. know, the way we were. I think that they were really just afraid, yeah. um, you know, and it's not that they didn't want to. My own mm -hmm. parents didn't register until, well, well, I was involved in the movement, and my involvement got, my um, activities got them involved. Mm -hmm. And they, neither one of them had registered to vote, on, you know, prior to mm -hmm. my involvement in the movement. But they registered, and they both, my, my father, who was a good bit older than my mother, 
was in his 60s, up in mm -hmm. his 60s, the first time he voted. And my mother was in her late uh, 50s wow. or early 60s, the first time mm -hmm. they voted. And I will tell you, from that time on until they died, they never missed the opportunity mm. to That's vote. That's a wonderful, wonderful story. Okay, tell mm -hmm. us about the bus trip back from South Carolina, one of the most um, <clears throat> infamous journeys in the, in the movement history. Okay, we left, um, and I, I can't remember what day of the week it was, but um, it was probably a weekend, like maybe a Friday. So mm -hmm. we all boarded the bus, and we just made the assumption that we were going to, to repeat our activities of using the, the so-called white side of the, of the waiting rooms every time we stopped. Mm -hmm. And we did that several times. And our last stop must have been in, I guess, in Alabama before we crossed the Mississippi mm -hmm. line. And when we got to Winona, and we got off the bus, this several was, of This us, was pretty near home, wasn't it? We were pretty near home, mm -hmm. and we thought, okay, we're almost home now, mm -hmm. so no incidents, nothing happened, we're okay. And without even thinking about it, um, several of us got off the bus, and we went to use the restroom, and but before we could even, you know, get inside, there were carloads of, of, of highway patrolmen and local police there. And they ordered us out, and we refused to leave. And so they just um, grabbed us and, and threw about, all of us in the back seat of one, one car, mm. just piled us in on top of each other. And Mrs. Hamer was one of the people who did not get off the bus mm -hmm. initially. When she saw us being arrested, she got off the bus, this bus as fast as she could mm -hmm. and said, oh, well, I know. When, when they started first arresting us, throwing us in, Anel Ponda pulled out mm -hmm. a pad and started writing down the, the license oh, plate number. Mm -hmm. And that, at that point, they just threw everybody in, and, it, and then Miss Hamer got off the bus and says, what is going on? What are y'all doing? Why are you arresting them? Mm -hmm. And they threw her in to the car, too. And when we got to the jail, um, and we, I guess we went to the city jail or county jail. I'm not sure where we were. Uh, when we got there, the jailer uh, didn't quite know what to do with us. There was... Um, me and Miss Hamer and Anel Ponda and June Johnson and I think Rosemary Freeman. Mm -hmm. I'm not mm -hmm. sure um, the makeup of the group, but Anel Ponda was the spokesperson, and she kept asking questions. Mm -hmm. And of course, they called her. She she was an older person, right, and college like, educated yes. and very professional. Very professional, very soft spoken, mm -hmm. uh, very articulate. Mm -hmm. And she kept asking, why had they arrested us? And, you know, what had we done wrong? And that there was a, you know, we were not violating any laws because the, the ICC, what is that, the Inter... Um, the State Commerce, uh, Commerce Commission. Commission mm -hmm. had already had passed this law mm -hmm. that it was illegal mm -hmm. to have separate waiting rooms. Mm -hmm. And we were just exercising our rights as citizens, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, and, and it was very lawful. And... So the, the jailer just kept, kept telling her to shut up. And then she said something to him. And now he asked her a question and she said no. And she, he wanted her to say no sir mm -hmm. or yes sir. And she said, well, I'm not gonna say that. She said, I'll answer your question, but I'm not gonna say yes sir or no sir. And at that point he just, uh, he, you know, he started hitting her. And, and what he did to me, and then I spoke up and said something, because at this point, I had no fear. I yeah. don't know, I mean, what? Is, you were just you know, a kid. I was a kid, so <laughs> I was, a, and I had never really, ex, you know, had a confrontation mm. with any white person mm. that, you know, I'd never seen the, the kind of meanness mm. and just evilness that, you know, that I, that I witnessed then, and so, but I, well, I still wasn't afraid. So I said something, and the jailer took it. So he had this huge, I'll never forget, this huge ring of keys. And he took them and he jabbed them in my side and stumped my foot and just told me to shut up. And I was going to keep on talking, and the nail just said, 
that's okay. Don't don't say anything else. And then they put us all in cells. And so I was I shared. Um, they had they had a row of cells, and so the very first cell was left empty. And Miss Hamer and I were in the next one, and then June Johnson and Anel were on down the line. Uh, Anel Ponda was the first person that they took out, and. Since Ms. Hamer and I were in the cell right next to the empty one, what they did was that they, they took us into, they, they would take you into a cell, that empty cell, mm -hmm. and make you lie on a cot. And there were two um, trustees mm -hmm. who were there, and they were, you could smell the alcohol on their breath. They, you know, they really didn't want to do what mm -hmm. they were doing, but they made them drink, and then they were, they told them, you know, to beat it. So you had to lie on this, um, this, this cot in that cell. And I could just hear them, you know, hitting. They had this huge strap. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me it had holes in it or mm -hmm. it had something yeah. attached to it. And they were, I could hear Anel just kind of moaning. She didn't scream out a lot. But, and then finally they left, they brought her back and they let her pass us and I could see that her, you know, her face was bloody, she was bleeding, her dress was torn. And then they took June out. June was a, you know, didn't look, June was only 14, mm -hmm. I was 17. June was a tall girl mm -hmm. and she looked older. She asked, as a matter of fact, she looked older than I did. And they, so they took her out and then the same thing happened with June. Then they took Miss Hamer out. And she was in your cell? She was in my mm -hmm. cell. And oh boy, they really worked her over. And I could just hear her, her screaming and screaming and just, you know, asking them to please stop. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, why are you doing this? She said, you, you are just like me. You know, you're, you're black like me. So why mm -hmm. are you, why are you beating me? And they just, they kept going at it. And finally they brought her back. And then they took me out and took me to that cell. And um, they made me lie on this cot. And they raised a strap up and just hit me one time. And at that point, the jailer came in and said, stop, hmm. take her back to her cell. So we're thinking that what had happened mm -hmm. by that time is that, because two people, one or two people had been left on the bus and they mm -hmm. had gone back to to Greenwood and they told everybody what was going on and so they immediately started calling, looking, trying to find us. And I think what happened, uh, by that time Giot also yeah. had probably made it to Winona, but mm -hmm. they arrested him. We mm -hmm. never saw him. They arrested Giot, really beat him up really, really badly. And you know, I, I didn't think about this until later. I said, I wonder if, if one of the reasons that Giyot was so adamant, I mean, he was that kind of a person yeah. anyway, he had promised my father that nothing would happen oh, to me. Yes. And so he says, oh my God, I gotta get that girl. It'd be worse to face so, your father than the sheriff. <laughs> I know, I know. So Giyot was, was, was beaten and so they brought me back to the cell with Miss Hamer. By this time, I'm thinking it must have been Sunday. Mm -hmm. It was Sunday night, and Miss Hamer was in such pain. Her hands were all black and blue and swollen, and, and her buttocks was all swollen and hard, and she developed a fever. And the only thing I had was a washcloth, and we had a sink there with, you know, I, could, I put, kept putting cold water mm -hmm. on it and, you know, and putting it on her forehead, trying to bring her fever down. And, and we, we, we didn't get any sleep, of course, yeah. that night. And so what we did do, I mean, we decided, you know, when, when she calmed down a bit and the pain wasn't so bad, we decided that we would sing some, uh, some oh. songs. And Ms. I Hannah, had no, I was, that's news yeah. to me. I didn't yes, know that. we did. Mm. We decided to sing a bit. And we did just, you know, a few songs. We didn't sing all night, but we did it quietly. Mm -hmm you know, for ourselves. And one of Miss Hamer's, of course, her signature song is This Little Light of Mine. Mm -hmm. We didn't, but she wanted to do the gospel mm -hmm. songs. And one of her favorite songs, her gospel songs is, um, if I can remember the name of it, Walk With Me. Mm -hmm. And we did that one. And it was just powerful and that calmed her down. And it was like, you know, walk with me, Lord, please. This is gonna make me cry, mm -hmm. so I don't know. Okay. <laughs> So, I 
about stuff. <laughs> okay. It's okay. Can we stop on that? SNCC knew that you were there. They had people calling the jail, lawyers calling the jail. And uh, did that have an impact on how you were treated from that time on? Well, I think it did because there were no more beatings. And uh, we did, we, we were roused one night and we didn't know, they talked about moving us mm -hmm. because I think that they thought that people knew where we were and they weren't quite ready to let us go. Mm -hmm. So they talked about moving us in the middle of the night, and we decided, and they all decided, that we were not going to go anywhere. We were mm -hmm. really going to just, because we didn't want to be taken out somewhere yeah. in the middle of the night and, you know, and, and disappear forever. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, Anel was really very outspoken at that point and told them that, you know, that we're not going anywhere, you're not going to take us anywhere. And so they decided not to do that, and they put us back in our cells. And I'm just, I'm telling you, I don't remember much of what happened mm -hmm. after uh, we were arrested, I think, maybe on a Sunday, mm -hmm. and we stayed there maybe until Wednesday mm -hmm. or so. And I don't have a lot of recollection mm -hmm. of the day-to-day -day activities mm -hmm. of what happened. And then um, I think it was on Wednesday, uh, Andrew Young and... There was someone else who came with him to get us out of jail. Mm -hmm. And he informed us that um, the first thing he told us, he said, I've got some sad news, mm -hmm. and, and I'm pretty sure this is right, this is accurate. He told us that Medgar yeah. Evers had been killed, mm -hmm. had been assassinated the night before. Mm -hmm. And he said he was, um, you know, had left a, a meeting in Jackson, and he was on his way home, and he'd been... He'd been ambushed and killed. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the joy of getting out mm -hmm. was just um, totally overshadowed. Mm -hmm. I really didn't know Medgar. I knew who he was, mm -hmm. you know. But um, it was just a sad, sad day. Well, for a lot of people, that would have been an indication it's time to get out. I, I paid my dues, let somebody else. What was your attitude after Oh, my attitude was that I was just getting started, mm -hmm. you know. I'm 17 years old, and I mean, I'm, I'm home, and, mm -hmm. and I'm just, you know, this made me more determined mm -hmm. um, to stay involved. And that was Miss Hamer's attitude, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, she said, I'm not going to let this um, scare me off. Mm -hmm. And so that's when, I think that, that time in the wine owner jail for, for all of us was, was especially was, for Miss Hamer, it was like a, it was a, a watershed event. It was a turning point mm -hmm. for her. And after that is when she really came into her own and she mm -hmm. became a national, you know, just a national figure. And <clears throat> with she, that great voice of hers mm -hmm. singing and speaking everywhere. You know? And she told the story of Winona at the Democratic National Convention mm -hmm. a year later mm -hmm. with an audience of millions. Right. And it was exactly. the dramatic point of the entire convention. There was a trial held mm -hmm. in Oxford, and you attended. Of, I did. Of, uh, the, there were people who were charged. Talk a little bit about that. That's sort of a footnote, but interesting, I think. You know, during that trial, <clears throat> I, they, took, they got our story, okay? We, we were in Oxford for maybe uh, for several days or probably about a week. And uh, when I took the witness stand, because we were not allowed to hear anybody else's mm -hmm. testimony, <clears throat> when I s took the witness stand, I was simply asked um, just a couple of questions. I mean, was I arrested? Mm -hmm. I said, yes. Was I beaten while I was in jail? And so my answer was, was no, mm -hmm. because I got one lick yeah. with a strap. Mm -hmm. and. They gave me no opportunity to explain mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. what I heard, yeah. what I saw. They only wanted to know what happened to me. So I, I don't really know much about what went on. We were, like I said, we were not allowed to hear anybody else's testimony, mm -hmm. and you were just kept away. 
and I spent maybe less than five minutes on the witness stand well, it seemed, myself. It seemed like the prosecutor, and if you can say that, would have been more interested in getting your story out. It, no, that mm. was not the case. Mm. I was not allowed to elaborate. I don't know about other people, but I was not allowed to elaborate mm -hmm. on anything. And I think they seized on the, uh, when I said no, I was not, I mean, I don't mm -hmm. call, look, when I heard what happened to the other people mm -hmm. and the length of time they were beaten, mm -hmm. what I got I thought was the least of it. Yeah. And so, but I'd never had the opportunity to explain mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. you know? Things were starting to happen uh, rapidly mm -hmm. in Mississippi then. <clears throat> in the fall of 1964, uh, COFO, which was the umbrella organization of SNCC and CORE and local NAACP and other local groups operating under the COFO banner, decided to have a freedom vote to dramatize to the country that blacks would vote if given the opportunity. Um, tell us about that campaign and your involvement in it. Well, you know, I, be, I think it had been a long-held belief that, you know, the black people didn't want to have anything mm -hmm. to do with politics, and they would, we wouldn't vote, mm -hmm. even if we were given the opportunity to vote. But that, um, that campaign was, I mean, just proved everything mm -hmm. that, that um, the power structure was saying about what black people wanted and mm -hmm. what we would do. Um, I, I, I got involved in it, and one of the things that I did, though, I mean, from as a result of my citizenship training, and I had other training, too, mm -hmm. I, um, I know I went to Clarksdale and I went to another place, and I actually did mock, uh, you know, precinct mm -hmm. um, workshops, you mm -hmm. know, dramatizing mm -hmm. what could possibly happen. At this point, I'm 18 years old, yeah. and I remember uh, Aaron Henry... Um, arranged me to, for me to come to his he, church. He was the candidate us. for governor on the ticket. Yeah, and, and mm -hmm. we held um, workshops at his church. And there was another woman whose house I stayed at, Miss Piggy. And it was just it was just a lot of fun mm -hmm. conducting those workshops. And you know, people just got really, really involved mm -hmm. in their roles and all. And uh, what I know, I mean. The results of it is that there was just a huge turnout that mm -hmm. people voted. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, of course, it didn't really, we couldn't really actually vote mm -hmm. because people weren't registered, yeah. but that showed that people had a lot of interest in, in politics and, and being able to exercise mm -hmm. their, their right as citizens. So all this happened. There was uh, some publicity nationally, mm -hmm. not a mm -hmm. whole lot. But a lot of the publicity was uh, devoted to a group of white college students who came down from mm -hmm. Yale and Stanford uh, to assist in that campaign. And although the SNCC had been active in Mississippi for several years now, why the white supremacists were still in control, you now had a revived Ku Klux Klan that was mm -hmm. beginning to move. And the federal government was, uh, was not very helpful. So you had discussions in SNCC, in COFO, about may maybe having a summer project where you would invite, invite hundreds of people down from the north to work in local communities, in part to dramatize the plight of blacks in Mississippi, but also maybe to force the federal government to take action. Were you part of those discussions because they became rather heated at times? Well, I tell you what, I was not, um, you know, I'm, I'm 17 yeah. years old mm -hmm. and, and, and I, I didn't do a lot of talking. Mm -hmm. I was there mm -hmm. at the meetings and, and, you know, I basically agreed with, with what many people were saying because it, uh, the logic of it was that, you know, if, the federal government didn't seem to care much about what happened to black people. We were still being killed and mm -hmm. still being denied the right to vote. But if we brought down these, uh, you know, the, the, the children of affluent uh, people mm -hmm. from different parts of the country, and the, if they received the same kind of treatment that we had been, been getting, then, you know, the whole country is going to pay mm -hmm. attention. And mm -hmm. that is exactly what mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. You know, when they started being arrested and beaten and, and killed, 
Uh, I remember that I was a part of the, um, I did go to Oxford for the, uh, for the summer orientation. Okay, tell us about that. That's a very interesting time. Well, uh, you know, unfortunately, I mean, again, my mother took sick when oh. I was there. I left after a day. Oh, I, I had see. A, I had to come back mm -hmm. home. Uh-huh. But and you were there well, the first week. Two, I would say I left after two, a couple of days, two or three days mm -hmm. or so. Yes, and there were workshops, you mm -hmm. know, demonstrating to people what could possibly happen mm -hmm. to you, and demonstrating the nonviolent techniques um, of how to protect mm -hmm. yourself. Uh, you know, if things happen, and they were, you know, of course they were dramatized, and they were like, mm -hmm. you know, overdone. Yeah to give people a sense of what could possibly mm -hmm. happen and what mm -hmm. you had to do in case these things mm -hmm. happen because they could actually get to the point where you could be beaten mm -hmm. and worse killed. And before I left though, we got word that, um, that James Cheney mm -hmm. and, 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 and Michael Schwerna and, and Andrew Goodman, I had not met uh, Andrew because mm -hmm. he was one of the yeah. summer volunteers mm -hmm. going down. And he left early from the uh, the orientation mm -hmm. to go back to Meridian with uh, with Mickey and and with James. Mm -hmm. So I'd never met him. I later met his his mother. Mm -hmm. um, as a matter of fact, when we were working on the uh, the thirtieth reunion for the for yeah. Freedom Summer, mm -hmm. I, she came down and was a part of that. Um, so you you came back, and uh, the summer begins with the news that three civil war rights workers have disappeared, mm -hmm. and everybody understood <clears throat> that they were dead. Right. Um, tell us about that summer and uh, your role in it, your, your recollections of what went on. By this point, okay, in, this, in, the, in the fall of 1963, instead of going to college, I actually moved to Jackson. Mm -hmm because I had spent the summer um, working voter registration in Greenwood and Greenville. And um, in, the sp in the spring of 64, I was in Hattiesburg and mm -hmm. Macomb, um, you know, doing voter mm -hmm. registration. With the free Freedom and, Days there? Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, then in, in, in the spring of uh, 64, I was in Jackson, and so I started working in the COPO office. Mm -hmm. By this time, the COPO office was up and running, and as mm -hmm. you know, that it was uh, made up of um, SNCC and CORE mm -hmm. and the NAACP mm -hmm. and SELC. Mm -hmm. We all shared a space at the, um, at the, it was the Council of uh, Federated Organizations, and we shared this space there, and we had what we called, um, long before cell phones, <laughs> the Watts line. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I did was um, I learned how to use the Watts line, and we, we had to have somebody staff that Watts line 24 hours a day, you know, in case somebody mm -hmm. called in. And the Watts line was there so that if, if somebody got in trouble and, you know, they, they needed to get the word out that mm -hmm. they were in trouble wherever they were across the state. And they didn't have access to, uh, you know, didn't have money to pay for a phone mm -hmm. or something for, you know, to get to a pay phone. They could maybe use somebody's phone mm -hmm. and call in and relay the message. And, and they were su it was supposed free. to check in every day. They too, were supposed to check in yeah. anyway, mm -hmm. every day. And so that's why we had to have staff there mm -hmm. manning that, um, that mm -hmm. telephone 24 hours. And so part of what I did was I took a shift. I, I was not out in the field mm -hmm. working um, and during the summer, but everybody at some point came through mm -hmm. the Jackson office. So I met most of the people mm -hmm. who were who were down that summer. Who else was working home. in the office with you? Um, well, the one of one of the people was the, was the person that I finally married. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, Jesse Morris, mm -hmm. he's, he's the father of my, my five children. And he had come in from California. <clears throat> right, he? exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So he was one of the people, actually, you know, uh, Jesse and Bob and Dave were... Bob yeah, Moses Bob and Dave Moses Dennis. Bob Moses and Dave mm -hmm. Dennis mm -hmm. were actually, you know, kind of in short... Well, they, they shared responsibility with one in the, uh, mm -hmm. the summer project. And um, I'm trying to remember... Oh, um... Who else was, was in that office? I met um, uh, Gwen Gillum that mm -hmm. summer. She, she worked, because mm -hmm. um, she was a student. She's from Alabama, mm -hmm. 
she and was she a Tougaloo was a student, student. at Tougaloo, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And I met her. Well, I actually met Gwen, I guess, in in maybe in yeah maybe the spring of 1964, mm -hmm. and we became really really good friends. Um, I'm trying to remember who else. There were mm -hmm. there were several people who were. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember if Mary King was there, no. Casey Hayden, mm -hmm. and these were uh, young um, white. Women from the from the South who had been active in SNCC for a right, while. Right, right. Donna Moses, mm -hmm. uh, who at one point was uh, Donna Richardson. Mm -hmm. She um, she and Bob uh, were married, um, and I'm I'm trying. I don't remember who else was mm -hmm. was uh, working in that office across mm -hmm. the summer though. Did but, you ever come across Worth Long? Oh yes, yes. Have you ever heard stories about Worth? He's a friend of mine. Oh, well, Worth is a friend of yours. Well, Worth used to come to town, and he stayed at our house many a nights, you know, whenever he would uh, come through and need a place to stay. And um, Worth was really involved, and he, uh, he was um, an, an oral historian. Mm -hmm. He liked um, to, to go out in the countryside and just talk to regular people and mm -hmm. find out what was going mm -hmm. on. And I remember later he was instrumental in, in, in getting the blues festival up mm -hmm. in the, mm -hmm. the Delta yeah. Blues Festival, and he uh, did a lot of arranged a lot of the documentation for the blues festival. Mm -hmm. So he was kind of a folklorist, and mm -hmm. he that's what I remember about Worth. And I saw him recently at, uh, and I was just surprised to see him because I knew Worth had, had been sick, but mm -hmm. I saw him at the Kofo office. Oh, there was something yeah. going on uh, just a few months ago, I believe, and so it was really good to no, see him. Yeah. 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 I talked to him and he said he's been feeling better the last uh -huh. year or so. Yeah, so it was really mm -hmm. good to yeah. see him yeah. up and about. You know. Anything stand out in the summer? <clears throat> Incidents, things you were involved in, violence? Well, there was always, uh, mm -hmm. there's, uh, you know, violence um, all over the state mm -hmm. being reported. And I'm just, I'm trying to remember, this has been 50 years ago, mm -hmm. John, mm -hmm. and uh, it's, I'm, I'm trying to remember details. If you want to the, ask there was me something, about Well, there was something things. that I, that I uh, came across about uh, you're going to a movie at the Lamar Theater or, or downtown and... Uh, Oh really? Yeah. No, I, what I, did I go to see? Oh, it I, was it was something, and and uh, a, I bet a young it man was, was West Side Story. Oh or something, yes, yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. Oh my, I don't I don't remember the details and of that. So, but somebody, I do. one of your uh, friends at the meeting was uh, at the movie was taken out and beaten and put you in know, jail. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I just well, don't maybe, remember that. Well, maybe maybe it's maybe I, somebody I has made that up. Going, but I, yeah. I don't know. It could have happened. It yeah, could have happened. Yeah. But I do remember going to the movie yeah. theater. Yeah. And at that time, you know, integration was just just yeah. uh, you know beginning to to take hold, and, and it was still kind of a you know. Um, well, a, a in, in no -no. Greenwood, of course, they had the McGee brothers. You know, they were integrating theaters and right. getting beaten right. up and all kinds of incidents. Oh. One of the major things to come out of uh, the Summer Project or Freedom Summer was the challenge of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, mm -hmm. which was challenging the legitimacy of the regular segregationist delegation at the National Convention in Atlantic City. Uh, talk a little bit about FDP and your relation to it and your thoughts. Oh, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Well, um, as everybody knows uh, by now, uh, if black people couldn't vote, they couldn't participate in in the in the democratic process. And so, they the the Democratic Party from Mississippi was almost always an all white delegation, mm -hmm. and this uh, the Freedom Democratic Party was formed. And it was made up of a cross section of individuals, you know, to kind of reflect the makeup mm -hmm. of, of the state. And when we went to Atlantic City, I was not actually, um, you know, an official part of mm -hmm. the delegation, mm -hmm. but I went along. I took a bus, and I think Miss Hamer was on that bus, oh. and I remember. We'll, we'll talk about your experience there. This, <laughs> okay. I didn't know that you were you were there. Oh, I actually went. So oh, yes, yeah. we, we rode a bus um, uh, up to Atlantic City, 
And um, when we got there, um, of course, we couldn't go in. We spent most of our time, you know, just outside the convention center there. But I remember that uh, when a few people we um, were allowed in, then we would uh, share the, the badges and uh -huh. so to allow as many people as possible. Yeah. Only a few could go in at mm -hmm. a time. So the badges were shared, and I mm -hmm. got a chance to go in for just a, just a few minutes. And we heard about Miss Ms. Hamer's um, testimony mm -hmm. and what uh, President Johnson uh, did you know when she was giving that really really powerful testimony? He called a press conference. Called a get press her off conference the air. to get her get her off the air. But most of our time was just spent, you know, just being there and being outside, being on the boardwalk, mm -hmm. and sometimes uh, singing freedom songs mm -hmm. and just giving our support. Were you lot? Know? Were you talking to people, or was that uh, was it mainly members of our the delegation that were talking to others? It was right. mainly yeah. members mm -hmm. members of the delegation. Mm -hmm. What was the mood there? Did you, did was there for a time after Mrs. Hamer's emotional testimony? Did you think you're going to win? We thought so. Mm -hmm. We thought so, but you know, then 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 this these factions developed. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, there were people who wanted um, to accept the compromise, which was two seats two at seats large. Mm -hmm. At large, two seats, and. Um, and Miss Hamer and and I think you need a Blackwell mm -hmm. and maybe uh, Victoria yeah. Gray mm -hmm. and these women, mm -hmm. these, you know, said no, no, we don't want two seats. I mean, Miss Hamer said, you know, we don't need two seats. All of us are tired, yeah. you know. Yeah. So she was against accepting mm -hmm. the compromise, mm -hmm. and there were a couple people who, well, not a couple. There were a lot of people who wanted mm -hmm. to accept the compromise, and. Um, there. So at that point, I think a you know a rift uh, mm -hmm. developed between um, the mostly the the rural you know mm -hmm. activist who had been you know down in the trenches yeah. really working for and they were working for more than just a compromise mm -hmm. you know they didn't think it was fair didn't think it was the right thing to do mm -hmm. to seat an all white delegation and just offer the the Democrats mm -hmm. who had a you know a, a composition that was more um, of what the state was made up mm -hmm. of. Mm -hmm. so. What was it like on the bus coming back? Did you were you depressed? Did you think you'd made your point? Were you eager to get back in the field? Oh, I was eager to get back. Um, at this point, let's see. This is um, this is 1964, mm -hmm. and you know though after. The 19, after the summer of 1964, mm -hmm. things kind of, you know, we were kind of, uh, you know, what, we weren't sure about the direction that yeah. we were going to go in. And things just kind of started to, you know, to kind of fall apart mm -hmm. in, in the movement. That We lost the focus, okay, we, you know, the, the, the voting, I mean, the, the Civil Rights Act, you know, um, I think at that point yeah, it, it was passed, passed mm -hmm. okay. And then the following year, though, the Voting Rights mm -hmm. Act mm -hmm. was passed. So it's and September of 64. The, what are you doing? You're oh, I decided to, it was time for me to go ahead and go to college. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. I enrolled in, 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 uh, in Tougaloo yeah. College along with uh, several other people, Gwen Gillen, Hollis Watkins, MacArthur Cotton, mm -hmm. and um, a bunch of other people. Mm -hmm. We were in a work-study program. Mm -hmm. um, so our tuition was paid, yeah. you know. And so your your focus then shifted more to education after that. It shifted to education, mm -hmm. and um, tell us something about Tougaloo when you were there. Well, let me tell you. I first heard about Tougaloo. I had no idea what Tougaloo was until because I was I was away from here, so mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about the colleges. Mm -hmm. I knew about Valley because yeah. that's where I'm from, yeah. Valley State University. But then um, one day we had a career day. And Amanda Elsie, that's a school that, now that was a consolidated school mm -hmm. that I went to that was right outside yeah. of Greenwood. And we had a representative from several colleges, and Tougaloo College was one of the, the places. Mm -hmm. And the man was um, 
he was a foreigner. He was a black man, but he spoke French. <laughs> and he had this wonderful accent. Yeah. And, I was, <laughs> and, I, and he talked about Tougaloo in such glowing terms. That, but mm. I, oh, you know what? I had heard about Tougaloo mm -hmm. College. I, I forgot. Because I meant to tell you this. When I was growing up, I heard a lot about my great-grandfather mm -hmm. from my mother. She said, and it's in the family that he actually, that he went to Tougaloo College. Oh, really? Yes. I've got a picture of my great-grandmother upstairs. Mm -hmm. And on the back of it, my mother was always fond of writing stuff mm -hmm. on the back of pictures. She's got written down, I'll show it to you when mm -hmm. we're done. Professor, she called it Professor uh, Jeff Davis. Jeff Davis, can you believe it? Pearson. <laughs> yeah. And she said he was. He went to Tuvalu College, and she lists all his wife, uh, mm -hmm. Georgia. That's the mm -hmm. picture of my great grandmother, and all of their children. Mm -hmm. Which uh, one of his children was my grandmother, his daughter, mm -hmm. Bertha Pearson. And what he did was that he educated. You now I also have some great uncles who went to college. Oh. Okay, mm -hmm. one was an accountant, and one did something else. That's very uh, unusual. Very time. unusual, yeah. but you have to mm. remember the times. This yeah. was like that first yeah. and second generation. Mm -hmm. This was during Reconstruction. Yeah. When there were okay. possibilities. Yes. yes, yes. And so they were educated and they um, they owned land and everything. Mm -hmm. And it was that generation, my mother's generation, mm -hmm. after that, you know, they'd lost everything and mm -hmm. went back to that system, well, went into that system, mm -hmm. the Jim Crow and mm -hmm. the sharecropping and all that. Mm -hmm. And my mother just was, when she grew up, she was, you know, she was very sheltered from mm -hmm. uh, the racism and whatever, you know. And then she married my father and she got thrown into this world that she knew nothing about, you know. Mm -hmm. But anyway, where were we? I was talking about something else. Well, we were talking about uh, being at Tougaloo. Oh, and, being at uh, Tougaloo. What it was and, like in 64, 65. Well, in, in 1964, Tougaloo, well, Tougaloo is a really different place from now. Tougaloo had this history, mm -hmm. you know, of, of being this oasis uh, it had, um, for the movement. Private school? Private school, small private school. Um, and it was, um, uh, it had the reputation of, 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 of really educating people mm -hmm. and and turning out people who would go on to be lawyers and doctors mm -hmm. and whatever. And I wanted so badly to go to Tougaloo. I just didn't think my parents could afford to send yeah, me. But was, then, was... after being involved in the movement, uh, someone arranged for scholarships mm -hmm. for those of us who wanted to go. And so maybe 10 of us mm -hmm. actually went started to Tougaloo. So I went to Tougaloo, but then I got married um, the following, um, early in, the, in, in 65, I got married. Mm -hmm. And I started having children. So I went to Tougaloo for two years mm -hmm. um, and a summer. Mm -hmm. And What was it then, like? Here you were all hardened movement veterans <laughs> and you're at oh, a school boy. with a bunch of kids who, uh, most of whom have not. It was, it was really difficult to mm -hmm. settle down and to, and to, you know, to get involved, to try to get involved in campus life. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I never really, really mm -hmm. did. I just mm -hmm. felt so removed mm -hmm. from that. I mean, I went to my classes and I did what I had to do in terms of my studies, but I didn't get involved much in, in the campus life, mm -hmm. which was, except for, you know, I made Excuse a few me, friends. Okay. okay. So it was just, it was really hard to, um, to make the transition from having been involved in the movement. I mean, I went to the March on Washington, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I'd met Martin Luther King, Stokely Carmichael, and, and all these people who had been involved in the movement. Mm -hmm. It was just a wonderful, exhilarating, exciting mm -hmm. time. And then to leave that and to come back and, and to move into a whole nother world, the academic world, when most of the students there, the girls were uh, trying to get into sororities mm -hmm. and the boys of fraternity. I never did get involved mm -hmm. in that. I just didn't see the point of it. Mm -hmm. And so it just happened at a time in my life when I had no interest in, in doing that. I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It's just that it was just something that I didn't want to do mm -hmm. after having you know been involved in the movement. So I'm, 
it was, but it was a good experience. Mm -hmm. I made some some lifelong friends at Tougaloo. Mm -hmm. Like it, it be, it, Tougaloo was like a family, yeah. a community in itself, right? What professors do you remember from it? Oh gosh, I remember. Um, oh my goodness, my well. Dr. Naomi Townsend, mm -hmm. oh, the great Dr. Naomi Townsend. I was in her class, and she had an upper level, I don't know how I got into that, mm -hmm. English class, mm -hmm. right? And boy, she was strict. Mm -hmm. At that point, girls could not wear pants mm -hmm. to her class. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> so I wear pants all the time, right? I mean, my uniform was jeans for the last mm -hmm. couple of years. I st and you could wear pants to chapel. Mm -hmm. We had to go to chapel, you know, mm -hmm. once a week. I stepped into Dr. Townsend's class one day, and she said, "Miss Simpson, I will have to see you after class." And everybody started looking at me. They knew what was coming, right? Yeah. And so she blessed me up and down <laughs> about, "You do not come to my class with slacks mm -hmm. on." Okay, Dr. Townsend. And then I, I had cut my hair. Oh. And I was wearing an afro, and she said, and another thing, why do y'all have to wear your hair like that? <laughs> Can't you just, you know, I mean, you're on a college campus now. Can't you do better than that? And, of course, I ignored her. That was early but, on. There were not many afros no, in 64, No, not many 65. afros in no. 64. And then on top of that, I used to... I used to ride a motorcycle to school, <laughs> a tiny little little white Honda motorcycle, because I lived in Jackson yeah. for about that time. And, and it's six miles out. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I tell you, there was some, some notoriety there among the, uh, mm -hmm. all the movement people. Mm -hmm. But I don't know why it was that we were, you know, why we stood out so much, because of the reputation that Tougaloo mm -hmm. had. I mean, you know, the Tougaloo 9 yeah. had been there, and yeah. it had been very open and we you know, receptive to the movement. I mean, we were accepted and yeah. and and got along well with uh, with our classmates. And my everybody. my experience was, and, and reading also was that that Tougaloo could mobilize its students, get a whole bunch of people mm -hmm. to come into the chapel when there was something going exactly. on. Exactly. And but it was really a much smaller group of students who were mm -hmm. active, yes. uh, especially uh, before 1964 and integrating churches <clears throat> and doing things mm -hmm. like that. But uh, remember Dr. Berensky? And oh, Dr. Berensky, <laughs> of course, Dr. Berensky. And the, and the forums that, mm -hmm. that he held, yes, I used to attend those. As a matter of fact, when I went to summer school, um, he, taught, uh, he taught me German. So I, mm -hmm. had, I only had the one class mm -hmm. from Dr. Berensky. And, but his, I mean, his forums were, were, were legendary. Bringing yes, so. people who were known internationally, who would come to Tougaloo because the, they'd heard about it. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. He was, yeah, he was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I want you to, to uh, talk about, well, two things. First of all, Talk about your life in the last 50 years. <laughs> and, uh, and then, well, just, just tell us about family, about what you what were up to, what happened, where, were you, where were you living, what were you doing? Uh, um, we want a full record here. <laughs> okay. Well, of course, I was married and then, then raising um, five children. Mm -hmm. So part of that time, I was... Um, I was just a stay-home mom, mm -hmm. and then I, I kept trying to go back to school, so I went to Jackson State for a while. I thought mm -hmm. I wanted to be a nurse, and, but this is when my youngest child, Jessica, she's, um, she just had a birthday. She's 35 oh. now. Is she the attorney? She's the attorney. I met her. Yes. Oh, you met yeah, Jessica. Yeah. Okay, okay. So when she was uh, maybe two, a couple of years old, I went back to school, mm -hmm. and I took all kinds of, you know, the sciences, the biology, and chemistry and all that stuff and after about a year of that I said oh I don't think I want to do this mm -hmm. so I stopped out again mm -hmm. and then I went um, uh, I in 1986 I believe I started to 86 87 I started the Millsaps mm -hmm. and I went for a semester what, what was Millsaps now, this is a predominantly white school a good liberal mm -hmm. arts college in Jackson well I tell you Millsaps was, I tell you, the most difficult school that I had ever been to. 
but I did better at Millsaps than I did anywhere. Oh. I was practically a straight A student. Oh, wow. You know, I was going part time, mm -hmm. but the last year that I was there, I was a full time student mm -hmm. and working full time and raising children, wow. and I did really, really well at Mill. I had some really good professors. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bavender. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. did you know yeah. him? Yeah. Oh my gosh, he was he was just the most amazing mm -hmm. man, mm -hmm. and he liked me. So <laughs> he, took, he took extra time with me. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, at this point, I'm in my forties, yeah. right? Yeah. You know. So um, I really liked Mr. Bavender, and I had I had other teachers too uh, that I liked at Millsaps. But Millsaps was was really really, it was very challenging yeah. for me. Mm -hmm. But I enjoyed my time mm -hmm. at Millsaps, and I finally graduated from. Mm -hmm. I stopped, and then I went back, and so that last time I was there, I was going full time. Must have been one of the so. old students there. Oh, I was, and I was right in there with the, with these young kids, and I was holding my own. And the the students who were younger would say, you know, well, you don't have anything to do. You just, you know, you just here taking a class or two. And I had to correct them. Yeah. And no, I'm full time. I'm working full time. I'm raising children. So don't ever tell me I don't have anything to do but study. You know? Where were you working? I was working for a time, I worked, okay, when I started out, the very first job I had was I was a legal secretary mm -hmm. for the largest committee for civil rights under law. Mm -hmm. I had gone, I had been in, I got my training for that when, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of MDTA, hmm. the mis, I mean, the, the Manpower Training and oh, Development yeah, yeah. Act. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. great society uh, program. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. exactly. So Hans Community College had got funded for one of those programs, mm -hmm. and they had um, a stenography mm -hmm. class that they a school, and we went to that class for a whole year, five days a week, eight you know, mm -hmm. eight hours a day to prepare us. And so the first job that I got was as a, a legal secretary mm -hmm. when I got out of that for the Lawyers Committee, and after that I went to work for Head Start. Mm -hmm. um, in Jackson? In Jackson. Mm -hmm. Well, Friends of Children of Mississippi is, mm -hmm. is the one I mm -hmm. got involved in. It was after the CDGM yeah. uh, business, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Friends of Children of Mississippi was, uh, was formed. And I went to, and the director of that was an old SNCC person, Fred Mangrum at the oh, time. Yes. You mm -hmm. remember, you yeah, know Fred? I, I knew Fred. Okay, mm -hmm. at the time that I was involved there. And then um, later I was an administrator, well, um, an office manager at um, Voice of Calvary's um, health clinic. Because mm -hmm. I moved to, uh, Jesse and I moved our kids to the country. Uh -huh. uh, we, we lived in Simpson County for, mm -hmm. for about four years. Oh. And so I worked at, the, um, at a health clinic in Mendenhall, um, kind of running that health clinic for a while till I moved back to Jackson. And then after that, I, you know, I went, I went to college and then I, also worked at Delta State hmm. University for a while. This is about in the it's late, in, the late in, 90s in, in Cleveland, Cleveland in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. I was a program administrator mm -hmm. then. We had um, three AmeriCorps programs, uh -huh. and so I was one of the people who was, um, who was uh, running those um, three programs. Mm -hmm. And But also during that time, um, I met Les and... Yeah, I, w I got a divorce, and so I, I met Les, and then we were together. We, we got married. Uh, we've been married for 15 years. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, you know, a, few, a year or two before that, I was working with him in his business. He had a consulting mm -hmm. business that managed uh, federal and state um, um, contracts. Mm -hmm. And we also did um, work with uh, the Kellogg Foundation. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we did, we worked, we were community coaches. Um, and What's a community coach? A community coach is that is a, is a person who, who works with, okay, the, the Kellogg Foundation had an initiative called the mm -hmm. Mid-South Mid Delta mm -hmm. Initiative. And what they did, they worked in the three states, Mississippi, Louisiana, and mm -hmm. Arkansas. And they funded programs and projects in communities, but these communities had to have involvement, uh, you know, across the boundaries. You had to, in, you know, be inclusive, inclusive mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, not just black people, but it mm -hmm. had to be made up of, of, you know, citizens across the, mm -hmm. the boundaries in those communities. And what they did was that they came up with, they found problems in their communities that they mm -hmm. wanted to 
to try to correct. Mm -hmm. And they would write a proposal and get it funded and they could have like maybe $100,000 or something mm -hmm. to get some of those initiatives wow. uh, worked mm -hmm. on. And the, the coach would coach them and you know to how to set up their organizations, how to to bring the uh, the different factions together, just help mm -hmm. them through yeah. the process mm -hmm. of fulfilling the um, the obligations of the grant that mm -hmm. they got. And one of the really exciting things that we did during that time, uh, we wrote and you know a, a side proposal to get to take um, several trips to Africa. Mm -hmm. To wow. we, we took some of the um, the participants in these organizations to uh, we we took three three trips as a matter of fact we went to um, Ghana mm -hmm. for a two week period and we took a mixed group the young people and old people and then we went to um, Senegal in mm -hmm. the Gambia once and on that particular trip uh, Mrs. Uh, Lily Ayers mm -hmm. who was at that point seventy five wow. years old and she had always wanted to go to Africa. Mm -hmm. She was on that trip with us, and she was a trooper. She was absolutely yeah. amazing. Miss yeah. Ayers is, is the widow of, um, of Jake Ayers, yeah. who yeah. was uh, uh, an activist, mm -hmm. and um, he was Brought instrumental in on, on that Ayers case mm -hmm. that's still being played out mm -hmm. right now. And then the last one other trip that we, we took a group of um, just 30 somethings and under. And, what, and the whole thing that we wanted to do, we hooked up with a group called um, Travel and Learn. And we planned an itinerary that would, mm. you know, just, exp it was, some of the people had never even been on an airplane. Wow. And they went, uh, you know, from the Mississippi Delta mm. to Africa. And they interacted with, um, you know, they, they got introduced to international travel, got mm. introduced to, you know, to be living in other cultures mm. and sometimes roughing it and sometimes, mm. you know, living better than they had been living at home, mm. you know, because we stayed in really great Great hotels. It must have been um, fun. Too. It was. It was amazing. It was really, really yeah, fun. Yeah. Yes. So then, I also did social work. The last mm -hmm. thing I did was that I worked with, um, um, let's see, one of the the, let's see, I can't think of the name of it now. The development groups, the um, community development groups. And they had a program, an aging program, mm -hmm. and so I did social work for about three years, working with people who had been victims of the Katrina oh. um, mm -hmm. um, storm. And these were older people who had been displaced and they had mm -hmm. moved to the Jackson and surrounding oh, areas. Wow. And we were helping them navigate the system, just mm -hmm. you know, trying to get resources for them, whether it was health care or... Mm -hmm you know, ride to the doctor, food, just whatever they needed. And mm -hmm. so I did that, and that was very, very rewarding. Yeah. I'm still, you know, I still keep in touch oh. with, with one or oh, two of the people that I worked with, wonderful. one of my, wonderful. the cases that I managed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have uh, uh, been living in Mississippi most of your life. You mm -hmm. participated in the most important social movement the country has seen since the crusade to free the slaves. And you've seen a lot of change take place. And, and the final question is, is for you to just to tell us what you think the major positive changes that have taken place in the state as a result of the movement and what needs to be done. What are the major problems facing <laughs> us today? Wow. All right. Uh, well, of course, some of the positive things um, is that, you know, that there's a lot of surface changes, mm -hmm. okay? And, well, I mean, there are a lot of changes that you can't um, really quantify mm -hmm. either. Or, but some of the major changes is that, okay, during the movement, what the, one of the major things that happened is that black people, you know, got a sense of, of who they were, a better sense of who mm -hmm. they were, mm -hmm. and that they started to, to reevaluate and to rethink about who they were and and their worth mm -hmm. and began to just to see themselves in a different kind of way to see that they were not powerless and we always have power but they had we had somehow given up our power mm -hmm. to other people but in order to get it back you know when when change is coming it's um Sometimes, like Bernice Regan sings, uh, she starts out uh, on one of the songs that they, that on one of her albums, 
says, when you see change is coming, if you want change, you have to walk into the storm. Mm -hmm. And when you get to the other side, things will be different. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, kind of how I see what the mm -hmm. movement. People actually just, you know, not knowing what was going to happen to them, mm -hmm. they actually walked into the storm because they needed mm -hmm. and wanted change. And things have been different. Mm -hmm. So now I live in this neighborhood mm -hmm. when, you know, 50 years ago, I couldn't have lived here. Mm -hmm. You know, it's predominantly white. The houses are nice mm -hmm. in this neighborhood. I can live, people can live in where they want to live. We, can, The schools now, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. uh, the schools in Jackson, uh, you know, there was white flight from the schools. Most of the white people go to still go to, I mean, at this point, they're in, in private schools, mm -hmm. the academies are still, you know, very much alive. The public schools are um, probably 90% uh, black. Mm -hmm. So in that regard, we're about where we used to be. Yeah. And people always point to the change as being, you know, the number of black elected officials that we have. But that's, 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 um, that's a change. But I don't know how that has, you know, played out for the average person, how that has really benefited mm -hmm. um, the masses, mm -hmm. you know. So what are the major problems then facing? The major problems are still, I mean, you know, crime. I'm just looking at, yeah. at our area yeah. here. There's lots of crime. There's, uh, the school system is in Jackson and some of the surrounding areas. Not very good. And mm -hmm. so, they're, you know, we're trying to work on that. And, and as it happened, you know, we have a lot of black elected officials. You know, we have a black mayor. We... Mm -hmm. We have uh, the school board is mostly black. We have um, our city council mm -hmm. is predominantly black. But what has happened is that, you know, economically, uh, the, the power structure hasn't really changed all mm -hmm. that much, you know. All the major businesses are still yeah. owned by white people, mm -hmm. and a lot of them have moved out of uh, the Jackson area, mm -hmm. out of the city of Jackson and into Madison County and Rankin mm -hmm. County. And so what has happened, the, you know, the tax base has mm -hmm. been eroded. And so if you mm -hmm. don't have money to fund um, mm -hmm. the schools, you mm -hmm. can't really, you know, improve it mm -hmm. all that much. Mm -hmm. And so some of the schools are really in bad shape. Yeah. You know, every year they do a report card on the schools, mm -hmm. and there are just way too many of them that are in, mm -hmm. you know, C and D and sometimes F yeah. rating. So we still have a lot of work to do, and I think most of it is, is on education yeah. okay. and trying to control crime mm -hmm. uh, in this area. You know, there's not there's hardly a week that goes by that some, and it's mostly in this, you know, black on black yeah. crime, that some young black man is not shot or, you know, or killed another one. And when I was a kid growing up, that kind of stuff was so... Yeah. So we, you almost, I remember one case mm -hmm. of a black man killing another one, just one, yeah. the whole time that I was growing up. And it was so traumatic that I had nightmares about it. And I, mm -hmm. I only knew one of the men, I knew the mm -hmm. one who got killed. And it was just, it went through our community like wildfire mm -hmm. when this man was killed. And now it's just so ordinary yeah. that you just don't you hardly blink an eye when you hear about it you know drugs and gangs imported drugs from the north they weren't they weren't around exactly mm -hmm. exactly nobody yeah. knew anything about that yeah. kind of stuff yeah. yeah your children grew up in that time of transition mm -hmm. this is the final question talk about your kids what they're doing <laughs> okay let me start with my oldest one his name is earl he owns a small construction mm -hmm. business, so he's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he, he works for himself. He has a small crew. Sometimes it's 10 people, mm -hmm. depending on the, mm -hmm. the jobs mm -hmm. that he gets, and sometimes it's four or five, you mm -hmm. know. So he lives in Madison, but, um, you know, his business is, is in this area. Mm -hmm. My next son is Orlando. He's a fireman, mm -hmm. and so that's the major thing mm -hmm. that he does. Well, Earl is married. He has uh, four children. Orlando is also married. He has three. Mm -hmm. And my next son is Omar, and uh, he has a couple of kids. He's not married. And he is um, an IT specialist. Mm -hmm. um, and he, his job was, um, was bought by another, I mean, his company was, was uh, sold to another company, so he lost his job mm -hmm. three years ago. And at that point, he decided that he would go back to school. Mm -hmm. I mean, he has a degree in political science. He went to Rollins College. Mm -hmm. Orlando went to uh, Alcorn mm -hmm. College. Earl 
went to uh, two years at uh, um, Hines Community mm -hmm. College. Mm -hmm. And Omar um, decided that he would go back and get a degree in, in computer engineering. Mm -hmm. So he's getting close to finishing that up. He's mm -hmm. at Jackson State. Mm -hmm. And then the next one is T. Of course, you know T. And mm -hmm. she has um, a doctorate, and she's teaching at the Ohio State University. Mm -hmm. And then has my a, youngest... Has a book coming out. Has a book coming <laughs> out, hopefully, <laughs> within the next year or yeah. so. And my youngest child is Jessica, mm -hmm. and she's an attorney. She went to... Um, she graduated law school in Michigan, and she's been an attorney, practice an attorney now for, I think, seven years or mm -hmm. so. And she worked for a local law firm here in mm -hmm. Jackson. Mm -hmm. And that's it. You, Mr. Simpson, thank you very much <laughs> for inviting us in. This has been a wonderful okay. time for me, and uh, I'm sure that the people at the museum and the many people who are going to be viewing this will share my sympathy. Well, thank John, you again. thank you. That is so good to see you. <laughs> yes, it is. It's, even and, in, in know, this setting. <laughs> in this setting, and you know... This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture.